Angela Rosenberg. Uh, Angela received a master's degree at the University of Miami Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences in 2011, and then did an MBA at the University of South Carolina, where she got to know Tim Conway, one of our other faculty here. Uh, Angela and I have known each other for several years. Uh, Angela used to be the science coordinator for the International Sea Keepers Society, and I'm ostensibly their science advisor, I guess. Uh, I chair their science advisory committee. The International Sea Keepers Society is a group of mega yacht owners and other people in the mega yacht, super yacht industry who want to do good things for the ocean and to keep it in uh, a pleasant state so that they can steam around in their yachts and, and do fun things. And they do scientific observations aboard their yachts. So I got involved with them. They developed a, a seawater flow through system that would measure uh, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, things like that as the ships were steaming around. Uh, they now have their yachts of discovery program where they take scientists out on their yachts. But Angela has left Sea Keepers now and is president of the Angari Foundation. Did I say that correctly? Angari. Okay. Angari <laughs> Foundation. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about what their foundation is doing. I'll turn it over to Angela. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for hosting me here and letting me tell everyone a little bit more about uh, my new foundation. And uh, I think this is probably going to be a little different than most talks you experience because there's not really data and graphs and so forth. Uh, it's more descriptive of what the foundation is all about. We were established in 2016, so we're really new. Um, and it's a family foundation with, uh, it involves my parents, myself, and uh, my sister, and I'll tell you more about everything with that uh, shortly. And I think to really understand what the foundation is all about and why it was formed, I have to probably tell you a little bit about myself. So, ignore the embarrassing pictures, please. <laughs> They're the only ones that my parents seemed to take of me when I was a kid, so. Um, but I had a great childhood. Uh, I grew up on the coast originally from Philadelphia and sailed the Chesapeake Bay with my family. I was actually sailing before I was even walking. Uh, so spent my entire life on boats. And then when I moved down to South Carolina, uh, I lived in Hilton Head Island for quite a while, raised there and spent more time on boats and near the water. And uh, started snorkeling very young. Uh, we would travel to Florida and the Caribbean and the Bahamas on a regular basis. And we just all grew up on the water. Um, I developed a passion for the water and everything underneath it and involving it. So when I was a junior in high school, my cousin was studying law at University of Miami. And I was now at the point where I had to decide what I was going to do for college and what I was going to study. And I always liked science, but I actually um, never realized that marine biology could be a career path. So he said to me, oh, you should check University of Miami. They have a great marine science program. So I did, and next thing I know, I attended University of Miami, studied uh, marine science and biology there, and then went on to, do, uh, to go to Rasmus and do a master's degree in science with uh, Peter Swart on the geochemistry of deep sea corals. And that uh, then led me to University of South Carolina, where I worked in Seth John's lab and with Tim. And while I was there, I also uh, completed my MBA at their program. So along the way, over the last 15 years, yeah, more embarrassing pictures, um, <laughs> uh, I was constantly trying to figure out what research I wanted to do. And so as an undergraduate student, I worked in several different facilities. I went to the Aplesia facil facility. I know, Lauren, you know this. <laughs> you were there with me for that. Um, did uh, research on coral growth and fragmentation recovery studied tumors in damselfish and DNA and microbiology research, and then uh, settled on geochemistry of all things. So I worked uh, on deep sea corals in for four years at Rasmus, and then moved on to work at University of South Carolina, where um, I was a geochemist and laboratory manager for Seth John in his office, um, in his lab, looking at metal isotopes in seawater and developing methods for uh, geotraces analyses, a program which is still going on quite strongly. And during all this time, I also uh, was developing other skills outside of research. So I've had my United States Coast Guard captain's license for 10 years now. 
Uh, I have certifications uh, related to yachting and boating and safety and firefighting and security. Um, I've been a diver for a number of years. And all of these put together make up Andrari Foundation. And my passion for that led to what I'm doing today. So I never thought I could actually find something that combines every skill I have, I think, and, um, and also do some good for the world and for science. So this is a picture of my family because it truly is a family affair. Um, I am the only, I'm the president and I'm the only full-time staff member. However, uh, my parents both sit on the board and my sister, who has her own full-time job out in Los Angeles, uh, consults on some of our film projects. So what is our mission? Well, we're dedicated to creating a global community that is interested, knowledgeable, and invested in marine environmental sciences by directly supporting research initiatives that foster greater trust and dialogue between scientists and the public. And we do this in a number of ways, and I'll go into all the details about how we do this, um, partially using film, um, other innovative technology, and media to raise awareness. So first, I guess I have to explain why we do this. So I'm going to throw up um, a couple articles from recent years about trust in science, and particularly environmental science. And I think with the current political climate, we all know that that may be a wavering subject. And the most obvious discussion would be trust in climate change science. So I'm going to throw a few stats at you. There is a little data in this talk, after all. And so 39% of US adults um, that were surveyed here believed in, the, in scientists being trusted in the climate science and the climate sciences and the causes of the science. However, out of those adults who actually were engaged in climate science, the adults who paid attention to ongoing science and were interested and actually sought out information on that, 67% of them trusted climate scientists. So obviously engagement and interest are important things, especially in our world. If you want to take that a step further and go beyond engagement and interest and actually talk about education and people being educated in science, well, 29% of the general public and 16% of the surveyed AAAS scientists believe that U.S. STEM education is above average or better. That's pretty low in the U.S. However, the majority of the scientists also feel that a major factor of this, of um, major factor in the public's limited knowledge affects the trust in science and the understanding of those. So it is a problem that actually can face all of us, not just even in environmental science, but in other sciences as well. And just through education, we can increase those numbers. So how do we do that? Well, communication is obviously key and sharing what we're doing. And I'm, from a personal standpoint, I've struggled with this myself. So I don't know if any of you have ever been in grad school and your parents say, what are you doing in grad school? What are you <laughs> studying? Like, what is it you just spend all day in the lab doing? So I was in grad school and my parents asked me exactly that and my family and friends asked me that. And I was studying geochemistry. And you try explaining geochemistry to someone who isn't a chemist or a scientist or anything else. It's not easy. And I explained it to them. And you know, a minute later, they sort of lost interest and said, oh, good for you. Great. Sounds wonderful. And you know, went on their way. So, I understand the concept of it being really difficult to explain things. And I swear, I have intelligent family and friends. There's no doubt about it that these people should be able to understand. But it's hard to explain. And it's hard to provide tangible things that someone can look at and understand and uh, relate to. So I think we as scientists all face a lot of challenges in communicating what we're doing. And some of these I put up here, you know, relating to an audience and um, specifically understanding and knowing prior to a presentation what the audience's knowledge is and where to start on that. Um, scientific jargon is obviously one that people always struggle with if you're not in the scientific community. And then I think for a lot of us, we never got appropriate scientific um, science communications training. And most importantly, we don't have the opportunity to present outside of the science realm very often. Um, a lot of us attend conferences that are very specific to our field and we're not presenting to the general public. So one of the major things that Andrari wants to do is we want to unite the science and non-science communities and provide scientists with the opportunity to share what they're doing, share their research, and have broader impacts. 
So in a nutshell, our goals kind of outlined our research, education, film, and community. And I'll kind of go through each one and, and tell you more about it and exactly how we do this. So specifically, what we do to accomplish these goals is we first provide an exceptional research and education platform. And that's in our research vessel, also named Anjari, which I will show you all the details about shortly. Um, we promote scientists and their ongoing research when they're working with us. We also develop standards driven curriculum and lesson plans around the research that's going on as well as um, the film and uh, other media that we do. And then we increase community engagement by publicly sharing these expeditions and scientific findings and offering enriching opportunities to the community and the broader world. And we're made up of a lot of different people. As I said, I'm the only full-time staff member, but we work with a huge group of um, marine scientists, teachers, professors, captains, divers, people from the film industry, um, film editors, directors, cinematographers, and then, of course, business people. So this is our research vessel. Um, almost all of our programs are centered around our 65-foot vessel. It's kept in West Palm Beach, Florida, but uh, operates much further than that. And to give you some details, I'll go through and try to give you a virtual tour since we're not all on the dock in West Palm Beach right now. Um, we spent about six months looking for a vessel that was appropriate and uh, what we wanted. So we found this one. It's a 2001 Grand Alaskan trawler-type vessel. It's 65 feet in length with a beam just over 17 feet. Um, we wanted a shallow draft so that we could do coastal work, um, potentially river work, and work on the banks of the Bahamas, Keys, Dry Tortugas. Uh, so we have a five-foot draft. Our cruising speed's 10 knots, which is typical for most research vessels. It's also very fuel efficient, and if we slow down, it's even more fuel efficient. And uh, a range just over 600 miles. And when we acquired this vessel, it was being used recreationally, so we had to do a lot of um, outfitting and refitting to make it work for our purposes. So we spent three months in the yard doing uh, mechanical upgrades, uh, navigation and electronics, so we have the most up-to-date uh, charts and everything on board. Uh, safety updates, obviously safety is important. Uh, we changed some of the stateroom layouts, so we sleep six scientists with two crew uh, for overnight expeditions. We added outdoor and indoor workspaces and uh, research spaces, including a full laboratory inside. We have a dive center on board with an air compressor. Uh, we also added cameras and video recording capabilities, not just for safety, but also so that we could record ongoing research projects and expeditions and share them with people. Not just We share them with the scientists. Um, we also share them with the general public, social media. Uh, we have underwater lights and camera, which definitely make working at night a little bit more fun. And um, communications, including internet in, uh, unlimited internet in U.S. waters and, and enter entertainment. So it also came with some equipment that I felt was necessary and a pro for most research. And that includes uh, balanced stern thrusters, which really give us great maneuverability. So if you need to move two feet one way or the other, we can quite easily. Uh, it also was built with oversized fin stabilizers. And I don't know how much you guys know about boats, but um, stabilization is quite a nice feature when you're out in rough seas. So uh, while we're underway, it makes a very big difference. Uh, the dive center, as I described, we have full sets, four full sets of gear that we carry um, in a range of fit anyone and an air compressor. We have a 1,500-pound capacity crane, two generators. We actually upgraded our generator so uh, we have more power, and a 14-foot rib uh, rigid inflatable tender with a 50-horsepower engine for uh, smaller trips or shore-to-boat trips. So I'm going to try to give you this, this tour now <laughs> as best I can. Um, <coughs> I don't have a pointer, I don't think so. OK, anyway, starting from the stern going forward. So we have our swim platform. We have then an um, outdoor uh, cockpit here uncovered. We then move to a wet lab space, which is on our aft deck, also outdoor but covered. And I'll show you pictures of everything. Um, then through doors, you go into our interior laboratory area. And then forward in this area is living spaces. So we have the galley, uh, a day head, and uh, sitting area and lower helm station. 
<laughs> then on the upper deck, uh, which is our flybridge, uh, we have both uh, enjoyable outdoor seating and dining. <laughs> or you can work in the back. <laughs> with, uh, we have a huge empty space uh, with, where we can put equipment, uh, launch the tender. We store the tender up there. Uh, we have a big freezer up there. We can set up tables for uh, education or other or research purposes. Then in the lower deck is all of our staterooms. So forward is um, scientists and guest staterooms. So we converted the light blue stateroom into a triple. So we now sleep three people in that room. They have their own head. We have a bunk room uh, for two people. And then forward, we have a double bed. And then aft, we have uh, the crew area, which uh, we also split into two beds with its own head and laundry. So now for some of the actual pictures, maybe. There we go. OK, so this is the aft of the boat. Like I said, it is a converted yacht. Um, here, I'm showing you the swim platform. Uh, usually, there's also like rails that go in here for safety when we're underway, but they easily remove for work. It provides great water access. It's super close to the, uh, to the ocean. And uh, it just a couple, if you go a couple steps up, you're then in the cockpit. So I actually didn't plan on getting a boat with the cockpit, but it's like one of the best decisions I ever made. Because not only can you use it for storage, and it has this huge, um, under that hatch is our dive center, but it's protected. So when you're underway, you can operate everything you want from there. You can deploy, we've deployed plankton nets and other things from the cockpit, and, uh, and it's super safe. So even in rougher seas. Then if you go up a couple more steps, this is our aft deck. So this used to be actually a seating area uh, that we removed the seat and we added this long table. It's perfect for if you have samples that you just collected, if you have cores you want to lay out, if uh, you want to do some wet chemistry off the back of the boat. It's also covered, which is great. So you're not getting wet. You're not getting a lot of wind blown. Uh, fully lit. Underneath here, we have storage, and we also use a space to put larger bins that, or gear that people bring on board that need quick access, they need quick access to, uh, aquarium setups. Um, uh, what else have we put there? I don't know, nets, a lot, a lot of various storage things. Then if you go here, you can see the mat. So this is pretty much the door here. If you go through that door, then you hit our interior workspace. So this is an uh, air-conditioned laboratory. Um, the picture's a little dark, but as you can see, we have uh, chemical-grade countertops throughout. We have cabinets for storage, additional gear storage. Um, both the, this and those windows on the side open, so if you need quick access to the outside, it's quite simple. Uh, stool, counter, uh, standing height. And we do both dry and wet chemistry, as well as set up equipment. Or uh, we have some people we've worked with who do uh, genome sequencing at sea. We can set up that equipment for them. And here's another view from the other direction now. So you can see more bench space, um, stool set up for computer workstations. Through that plexiglass window is on the other side is our galley. And then across from this is our sink. So our uh, wet, wet workstation, if you will. <laughs> so we have a hot and cold fresh water running there. Then if you go up top to our flybridge, this is sort of what I was describing to you. Looking back, um, you have the tender under cover there. That's our 1,500-pound crane. Uh, down here, you can sort of see this picture. We have eyes, tie down eyes for various equipment, and then a grill for eating. But uh, on the other side of that is a freezer. And actually, there's the freezer. <laughs> so this is our uh, five foot freezer that we use either, um, it's available for scientific use, or if not, we can also use it to store extra food for those longer trips. And then forward in, on the flybridge, this is just our lounging and dining area. People enjoy working up there in the uh, fresh air. And we also have an upper helm where we usually steer with the best visibility. So then if you don't want to lounge up there, you're also allowed to lounge downstairs 
And on the main deck, we have, um, this is our lower helm with another lounging area where if the weather's not good or you just want some air conditioning, we have meals down here or you can work down there, uh, TV as well, and also give some presentations. We've done that before too and had uh, scientific meetings there. Then in the guest spaces, so this is uh, down below, we have three staterooms with two heads. This is the smallest of the three, and this is the um, bunk <coughs> stateroom, if you will, sleeps two. Then this is the room that we converted that sleeps three and has its own head. And then this is the double, which we refer to as the VIP or for the chief scientist room, you know. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Uh, in addition to the, all of this, we also offer some other services whenever you're doing an expedition with us. So first, uh, I think Mark can attribute to when I was working at Sea Keepers and all of, uh, I got very used to working in the yacht world and on boats that really weren't designed to do what, they, what we wanted them to do, which is how this sort of all came about, or one of the reasons it came about. But we always had a big make it happen mentality. So even if it's not perfectly designed for it, we will find a way to make it work for you. Um, we always have a uh, minimum two captains on board. I'm one of them. Uh, all meals are prepared by the crew, laundries done by the crew. Um, we have TV and internet available most of the time. We're video recording, so this is our camera system. This is just a screen capture of the screen of the camera system. So not just for safety, like the engine room on the right there, but down here is our underwater camera, um, which is recording. And then we also record the cockpit and the swim platform area. So a lot of work that's being done off of there, we're capturing all of that as we're doing things. And then, of course, the fly bridge up here as well. And just to give you an idea, here's some things we've done already. Uh, we did a couple trips with University of Miami Shark Research. So this was one of our shark tagging trips off the stern of the boat. Um, here's another trip that they did uh, off of West Palm Beach. And then we also did a coral reef trip last uh, fall in Florida, and that involved a lot of sampling and particularly a lot of filming. So we operate, uh, although we're based in West Palm Beach, we actually operate very broadly. Uh, we will do expeditions along pretty much the entire U.S. East Coast, uh, also Gulf of Mexico, uh, Florida Keys and Dry Tortugas, Bahamas, Caribbean, and Cuba. And as of right now, all of our trips have been off of Florida, but not to say that isn't going to change soon. <laughs> and then finally, so this, the vessel is made available for charter to scientists at cost. One of our goals was we wanted to cover operational costs of the vessel. And um, in order to do that, these are our rates. So we, uh, our day rate is $1,500, and then we have expenses on top of that. So all the expenses are also charged at the end of the trip at cost. So food, you literally, if it's a Publix receipt or whatever, that's what you pay. Fuel, same thing. Um, custom seats, all of that is exactly what it actually costs. And then there are slight discounts if you do five or seven days. And honestly, if you want to do more than seven days, we can talk about that too. <laughs> So before, um, the next part of my talk is about our education and film initiatives and some other things. So before I move forward, I just want to ask if anyone has specific questions about the vessel itself or what we do with the vessel or where we're willing to go, I'm happy to answer them now. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so do you have like a ballpark idea of what your expenses look like on one of these day trips? Or yeah, I can quote any of them for you. Um, if you have a specific, what I've been doing so far when a scientist asks, is uh, they tell me exactly what they want to do, and I will literally calculate the mileage and everything else and give you, here's a high estimate of what it would do. So it will probably come in under. In, in terms of your, um, the regions that you uh, sail to, do you, in those expenses, does that also include um, transit costs? Um, like so, so transit, I'm going to be honest, because we're, st we're starting out, so transit costs normally for a research vessel, you know, you cover whatever transit. What we're doing at this moment is we are charging you expenses for the transit, but not the charter day rate for the transit. Okay. That is likely to change next year, but for right now, that is 
where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on anything? All right, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, oh, go ahead. Do you, you have Unistrat um, in the, inside the labs? You know, like um, framing inside that you can use iBolt? Oh, to so to we have not yet installed that. Um, we talked about it quite a bit, and we decided we were going to wait to see what expeditions, because that's usually much more common on like major open ocean expeditions, and we don't necessarily see us doing as much of that. Um, but we, it's easy enough to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have a water maker on board. Yeah. But it doesn't look like DI. We do not. That is another thing that's actually on our list that we would invest in if the number of charters made sense to do so. Yeah. And if someone wanted to bring their own DI system on, like a you know a smaller barn said, we can easily hook that up. That's not an issue at all. Okay, so in addition to all of our research and chartering, uh, we also uh, work on a variety of education and film initiatives that the foundation funds. Uh, and some of these are further along than others at this point, but in general we do hands-on research day trips with students, uh, mostly local to wherever we are. Right now, being in West Palm, most of those are in West Palm Beach. If we did an expedition we were in St. Petersburg, we would do it in St. Petersburg, so forth. Uh, we visit local classrooms. Uh, we're working on several different um, professional development for teachers, so they can come on board and do a workshop with us and learn more about uh, marine science and take that back to their classroom, as well as get professional development credit for it. We're also uh, doing curriculum development and lesson planning around many of the expeditions and the research that is happening on board. Uh, we obviously have an uh, interest in STEM and STEAM, we're working with a number of universities that we've really just started talking to about how to have ongoing and continuing um, outreach with their groups. And then one of the more exciting things, in my opinion at least, is we're also doing virtual reality. So, so last fall when we uh, did our coral reef trip, we also filmed 2D and virtual reality. And the idea behind this is and this is headed up by my sister, the, the LA one. And, yeah. and uh, with virtual reality, we felt that it was a really innovative technology to take marine science and the research that's happening on Anjari and out in the field and bring it back into the classrooms and share scientific methodology with students, particularly K through 12 students. So we've actually done our first test pilot, which is really about the foundation. It comes out next week, actually. On, um, it'll be on our website and YouTube channels. And uh, the idea is that we will do three or four episodes a year, and we're going to pick projects, that uh, scientific projects and expeditions, that lend itself well to film, to virtual reality, and can be paired well with what students need to learn in the classrooms. So right now we're discussing, uh, we have a meeting actually this weekend with our Educators Council, which consists of five Florida teachers. Uh, and we are working with them to determine what projects might be best suited for our next virtual reality experience. Then we will pick a week, we will um, work with the scientists and go out, film for, do a full expedition for a week, film with them, do all the virtual reality, um, take that back, do post-production and make the full film, and then work with, combine the expert scientists and the teaching uh, educators council and they'll develop lesson plans together that are both scientifically accurate, number one, incredibly important, and also uh, work well in the classroom and with the teachers there. So those teachers, then once that's developed, the teachers will actually take the VR um, film, they'll take the lesson plans, they'll try it in their classrooms, and then that will be shared with whoever in the world wants to use it, pretty much. So we're starting in Florida. We have plans, um, actually we're already talking to a couple other states about accepting these things and working with them to meet their standards. And uh, we hope to be nationwide, like within a couple years, if not further. So that's one of the big projects that we're working on. Um, and really, we feel that it's super exciting. <laughs> yeah, everyone's enjoying it. <laughs> uh, it's quite intensive, and especially in post-production. It's not cheap, so um, we're working on funding for that as well. But 
being uh, able to take field work and take your experience out on the ocean and bring it back into the classroom is something that we're really excited about. And I know I would not be here today if I didn't have those experiences out on the ocean. So I'm hoping that others will feel the same way and sort of follow in those footsteps. So, and then we also are doing several community initiatives. Uh, this is sort of the raising the more general awareness. And those include uh, partnering with other uh, local organizations and communities or schools, uh, outreach events that we're attending and presenting either virtual reality or other hands-on experiences, uh, public seminars and lectures that we put together, press, social media, blogging, meet and greets with scientists. Uh, uh, people are always welcome to tour the vessel if they're in the area. And then we're uh, also creating short films and doing some local research projects that we're actually heading up. So to sort of bring this full circle and back to the science realm, we want to stay in line with our goals. And so one of the things we do on all of our charters is we offer uh, any charter over four, four days or longer. We offer education incentives to the scientists for discounts on the charter. So these are what we're offering currently. The first one being a digital classroom visit pre and post. This is where you would Skype with a, Andrari would put it all together. You would Skype with a classroom. You would explain what you're doing, what the science is, what the expedition is going to be all about, answer some questions. Uh, and then at the end of the expedition, you would do it again so that all the students could learn what happened, how you did it, how it went, what's exciting, you know, and kind of go full circle. Uh, we also can uh, put teachers, artists, press, or other uh, people that we select onboard expeditions if you don't fill it with six scientists. So you can get a discount up to two people for that. So we can sort of have broader impacts there. We uh, also put together, we have one scheduled next month, uh, school seminar presentations. So if you have an expedition coming up or if you just want to do one for the sake of doing one, we're happy to schedule a seminar at a local school for you where you give a presentation to the school and then you do a Q&A session. Uh, also meet and greets on board the vessel, and then of course in-person uh, classroom visits, which we're happy to arrange. So these are our current education incentives that we offer to people. Uh, if you do them all, you can work up to, I think, a free day and a half. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, and yeah, so, and these are offered obviously on our base charter rate, not on the actual expenses that you pay, like fuel and things. So, and they do have to be used within the same calendar year. However, you can save them up. So that, that is what we're up to right now. And I appreciate all of you being here. And thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Or thoughts or anything else. <laughs>